Morning, everybody. I'm just going to allow a little bit of time for people to start joining the, um, the webinar. <clears throat> um, right, okay, it's, it's two o'clock, so we'll make a start. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is um, Craig Evans, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for UCARTA, which is the UK Asbestos Training Association. Um, so welcome to the webinar. Um, the webinar today is on um, Asbestos, the Analyst Guide, um, in partnership with the HSE. For those of you who are not familiar with UCARTA, um, we're a not-for-profit association um, established in 2008. And we're committed to both maintaining and improving higher standards of asbestos training throughout the UK and also internationally. Um, UCART has around 200 members and those train those members train in excess of 200,000 people a year um, on all levels of asbestos training. Um, first of all, just want to thank everybody for um, attending today. Your presenter today is Sam Lord, um, Principal Specialist Inspector for the Health and Safety Executive. And the webinar today will focus on the Analyst Guide HSG 248. Um, Sam will deliver a short presentation for about 30 minutes um, and there will be opportunity to ask questions um, with the remaining time um, towards the end around half past two. Um, if you do have any questions for Sam, um, if you can write them using the Q&A section, please, um, rather than using the chat section. Um, and then, like I said, Sam will go through the, the questions um, after the presentation and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Any questions we can't answer today? Um, Sam will take back um, to the HSC um, or will follow up by, by emails. Um, any, um, anything else um, related to the webinar, um, please use the chat facility. So any technical issues, anything like that, um, my colleague Deb is monitoring the chat facility. Um, so you can, you can use that. Um, and that's it from me for the moment. Um, so I'll hand over to, um, to Sam Lord. That's great. Thanks, Craig. Um... So this is probably about the 10th virtual uh, presentation I've done. Um, I was saying earlier, I, I did, did get released last week to actually do it in person, but even then we had to have um, headphones on and so did the audience, so that was quite strange as well. Um, but yeah, the good thing about these uh, webinars is that we can, I can get to speak to um, much more larger numbers of people and um, hopefully uh, you'll all find this helpful. Um, and useful today. So thanks very much for joining. Also appreciate it. We've got some lovely weather out there. So the temptation to sit outside in the gardens there as well for those of you that work at home. So brilliant. Um, so I'm going to talk about HSG 248, which is the uh, the analyst guide. Um, before I start, I uh, just want to cover some important, uh, important points. Let me just... Uh, on this slide. Um, so this was actually um, put on our website uh, to download um, about the middle of May. So it's been out for about six, uh, well, actually, you know, eight weeks now. Um, and it's just like anywhere, you can find it anywhere else uh, on, on uh, just by putting in your search engine HSC 248 and it'll find you the link to the HSC part of the, the uh, website that you can download publications. Um, but what I would say is that since publication, um, quite expectedly, to be honest, uh, given the size and, and technical content, um, we've been informed um, of some editor editorial and some technical corrections. Um, so they've all been uh, gathered up together and I've, I've sent them back up to the publishers, um, I think it was last week, uh, and they will now, um, they've been completed. 
and they've, they're basically pressing print as we speak. Um, so the printed version, which uh, is that's one of the reasons why there's this delay between online availability and the print availability, but the printed version um, should be available uh, for any people that's pre-ordered or wants, wants a, print, a printed copy, um, that will be available towards the end of this month. Uh, and simultaneously, um, the, the, the updated or amended uh, web version will be available too. And um, if any of you have already downloaded it, the, um, it'll be distinguished from the May version by in the front cover, um, it'll have the July amended uh, version. So hopefully that will be clear. Um, and like I said, it's available for if you want a printed version, uh, I think it's £30. Uh, and again, you can get to that via the link that I mentioned earlier or separate via the HSE books. So um, why has it been updated? Um, you know, like most guidance, um, it accounts for any legal changes. So I think uh, there's been probably a couple of revisions of uh, the asbestos regulations and the associated uh, approved code of practice. Um, there's also been some developments in the analytical procedures and methodologies. So that's all been uh, updated. Um, but I think more importantly, and hopefully today you'll you'll get that sort of um, uh, that that sort of the the information really, or the the reasons why we've updated it, is because of this um, analyst inspection program which HSE did. I think it was back in 2015, uh, where we looked at various analysts undertaking the four stage clearance uh, aspect. And we found some quite, um, quite sort of, you know, uh, serious failings in, in what was happening on site. And so very much the findings from that have very much informed um, the changes and improvements and the clarification uh, to the guidance. And a lot of those will be brought out during the presentation today. Um, and I should also mention and thank anyone, uh, particularly if you were involved, but this isn't just written by um, uh, people in HSE beavering away in, at their desks, which is before I joined HSE, that's what I thought happened. There was just this massive office full of people writing HSE guidance, which was wonderful. Uh, but no, that doesn't happen. Um, this was uh, in, uh, in consultation with um, industry experts and technical experts. So it has been uh, very much consulted on and had input from those people. So uh, just a, as an acknowledgement at the, at the end of, at the back of the, uh, the document, um, recognizing those people that have helped. Okay, um, and finally, I just would say actually, the, uh, it's called Asbestos the Analyst Guide. There's obviously um, the word analyst in this context um, includes people that do um, four stage clearance um, testing, people that just do air monitoring, people that do bulk analysis of, of samples from surveys in labs. Um, and, and surveyors as well. So that term sort of covers all of anything that involves asbestos and sampling and surveying basically. So just sort of touching on what I was saying earlier, um, I think for me, and this is sort of the message which um, you know, those of you that, particularly those of you do train um, any, anyone that's in, in, involved in asbestos where they have to interact with uh, analyst organization, um, it's really about trying to improve the professional standards. And we must remember that you know, removing asbestos um, is, is, is basically something which is very quite challenging given that you know, what we're trying to prevent people getting exposed to is invisible. You can't see fibers. Um, but equally, um, you know, there's the requirement to make sure that all of the visible debris and dust is also cleared up. If you, if you clear that up, then you're, you're on a good footing to make sure that the airborne fibres are, are reduced um, to, a, to a low level. Um, and because there's no real time instrument like there perhaps would be if you had a radiation hazard, um, we do very much rely on analysts um, sampling the air, looking at the debris or sampling. And, and, and using their skills to um, make sure that everything is safe for people that are reoccupying buildings or working in buildings with asbestos. So I guess the message is that analysts really do have this huge responsibility um, placed on their shoulders and, and that shouldn't be uh, dismissed in the slightest and respect really needs to be given to them, particularly as you'll see later about giving them the amount of time and the communication needed for them to do their job. And, and they also need to realize this as well. And 
And unfortunately, because of that, um, this inspection program, um, incidentally, the uh, the first reference in the report in in the in the analyst guide is that report. So, if you are interested to see what things were like back in 2015, um, it might be helpful to to read that uh, as well um, to give you that sort of background. Um, but yeah, we still find I still coming across my desk. Um, I still see survey reports, I still see bulk analysis certificates or uh, clearance um, certificates. And unfortunately, whilst I, I obviously as an HSC inspector, I generally just get to see the worst stuff. Um, I do know there's some good practice out there for, for sure, but there's still not consistent standards um, out there and there is still poor practice. And I suppose, again, the message that um, hopefully you'll appreciate is that it's not just about guidance. Um, guidance is very important, as is regulation. But for me, I think um, it's also really about improving behaviour and work, working culture. Um, and this is where we need to engage clients who, um, who, who, who pay for people to come in and remove asbestos, the licence removal contractors themselves, how they interact and behave with the analyst. Um, and that's why I'm hoping and I'm very thankful today to be able to speak to such a, a wide audience. Um, it really, and I, I would sort of pass on that promotion of that message. Um, if, you could, if you could do that for me, that would be great because uh, it's not something which um, HSC or I can do on my, on my own and really do uh, value external stakeholders and, and how you can help um, us do that as well, ultimately to, um, to reduce the risk from asbestos. So I put together this little infographic, it's just a bit of fun really, um, but you can see, uh, I suppose the worst thing is that it's going to take six hours to read. Um, I don't, I wouldn't recommend anyone reading the entire document, you won't need to, a lot of it's very technical um, and certainly you wouldn't be able to do it in, in, in one go. But there's um, uh, definitely, there's, there's a large document, it's probably the biggest, or it is the biggest HSC, piece of HSC guidance out there. Um, so, uh, and it will be, um, it has been sort of redesigned, um, which I'll cover just now. So it's basically divided up into four parts. Um, parts one, two, and three uh, probably take up a third of the total document. And I would say, if you're just sort of generally wanting an overview of what, it, what it's all about, the analyst guide, um, there's definitely some really good content and you will be able to get a, a good overview of all the important things which um, are valid to this and how there is this interaction with clients and, and uh, asbestos removal contractors. So that would be my, my sort of advice. But if you are someone that actually practices as an analyst uh, or a surveyor, um, then you may want to refer to the specific technical appendix to that particular area. Um, there's also a technical appendix that's got some templates in it, template forms. And also, um, and I'll talk a bit more about this, there's a, a technical appendix which details core competencies. Um, and there's some core competency tables in there, which, which will be helpful, particularly uh, those of you who are uh, from a, a training background. Um, a lot of the text has been tabulated, um, again, for ease of reading, it's already quite a hefty document, so where possible, uh, the key bits of information are put into tables, and I'll, I'll show, I've got some illustrations uh, as part of my presentation today, um, I will make an apology, I've tried to, I wanted to show you that they were there, to get your, to get you sort of um, seeing what it was like, but you won't be able to read the, the detail, I'm afraid, because uh, I couldn't sort of uh, make them as big as I could. But um, but yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Um, it's more use of bullet points again uh, to make it easier to uh, get the key points out from various um, various parts of the guidance. Um, as I've said, a lot of the detailed technical stuff is all in uh, the appendix, technical appendices. And finally, um, those of you who are sort of involved in uh, bulk analysis, we previously, HSC previously had um, guidance in uh, MDHS 87 uh, for bulk analysis and also uh, during the water absorption test, if you're unsure if uh, a piece of material is um, asbestos insulation board. So that used to be in the ACOP, but all of those uh, documents, all, the, all that guidance is now consolidated into HSG 248. So it's a, a one-stop shop, if you like, for, for guidance for analysis. So um, 
I thought what I would do, um, as this is really a, a session really to update you on uh, some of the key changes, I'm just going to go through chapter by chapter um, the key things that have changed or uh, been expanded or greater clarity. Um, you probably um, haven't sort of, hopefully you'll be able to make notes. I don't know whether you'll get a copy of this presentation potentially, um, but uh, hopefully this will just sort of um, allow you to sort of pinpoint the, the key things that have changed from the old guidance. Um, but then what I've also uh, done is where I think um, there's a change that perhaps needs a little bit more explanation, particularly about why it's changed, because I think that's important. Um, those of you that are trainers or even you know, anyone, even regulators, we all have to, if we want to um, change the way people do things through guidance, we do have to explain the justification for that change, otherwise they won't do it. So again, hopefully today I'll be able to provide a bit more information uh, about that and that will be helpful. So I'm just going to go through now um, the various chapters. Um, so yeah, let's just do it. So chapter one, um, this is about the analyst role and responsibilities. Um, again, it's just really uh, clarifying a lot of um, uh, also uh, there's been some I suppose improvements or acknowledgement about analysts themselves and their own health and safety um, so there's stuff now about uh, personal monitoring for analysts um, they don't have to have it but it's recommended um, that they do and certainly people that are going in and out of um, four stage clearance enclosures um, they should be a low risk anyway, but um, they should be, uh, they, 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 their companies may have a, a personal monitoring uh, strategy for, for the analysts themselves. Um, there's guidance about for when analysts, when their work activities um, may be notifiable non-licensed work. So what sort of examples they may be. Um, there's also really this more, and this sort of is a thread that goes through the through the new guidance about getting analysts to be a bit more involved, particularly in the four stage clearance process. Um, and this is really, as I said earlier, it's about ensuring that they actually have enough time um, and resource to do their job properly. And in order to do that, they've got to know, like anything, um, you, you've got to know what you're, you're, you're getting yourself in for. So a pre-removal visit possibly, um, or maybe a copy of the, the license removal contractors plan of work, which will be obviously produced in advance uh, for license work. So that will give them an idea of the extent, the size of the job. And obviously the other thing that they must do because they are doing work with asbestos, they must also have the analysts themselves an adequate risk assessment and uh, a plan of work as well. And there's further guidance for um, on this issue of analyst impartiality um, and including where there's something called shared links. So there's examples of what those shared links uh, could be, what they look like, um, and really um, where, they, where, where they're unavoidable, because there will be some circumstances where they are unavoidable, or they preferably want analysts to be uh, contracted direct from the client. Um, where they are, where there have to be shared links, what measures um, people can put in place to demonstrate they still are impartial. So there's a bit more information, there's quite a bit more information on that. So chapter two, this is accreditation and quality assurance. Um, so in general, uh, there's uh, sort of greater emphasis and strengthening of quality control arrangements um, and the individual, individual accountability of analysts. Um, there's, a, there's new guidance on performance monitoring of analysts on site when they're doing four stage clearance uh, and there's some uh, there's an internal audit, I should stress. And there's also a, a requirement now to have this reinspection of stage two visual inspection. So when analysts go in and do their visual inspection of an enclosure um, shortly after. Uh, someone else from their company would go in and reinspect uh, either the entire enclosure or a representative proportion of that. And that would now be a, a part of the monitoring of the analyst work. And this is all really to improve uh, standards and, and make sure that they, uh, they, they are doing what they, uh, what they should be doing, what they've been trained to do. Uh, and to assist um, people doing, insist those doing internal audits like this, uh, there's a couple of tables, tables 2.1, table 2.2, 2, 2 um, which outline suggested auditing and desktop protocols for, for four stage clearance. And there's an example, uh, table 2.1 of what it actually looks like. 
Uh, and quality, obviously there's quality assurance and quality control requirements through all aspects of um, analyst work, bulk analysis in the lab, and that's been integrated into the technical appendices where appropriate. So chapter three is all about competence and qualifications. Um, and really, there's, I guess there's more emphasis, as there should be on everything really, about um, the competency that you achieve, uh, so the knowledge and the skills you obtain um, once you've been trained. So um, rather than just detailing the training inputs, and again, um, I appreciate I've probably got a, an audience of trainers, so you'll hopefully realise the value of training, but also taking that forward once they leave the training room. So, so that's sort of the 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 general sort of line along uh, within this uh, within this particular chapter. Um, there's a couple of tables that detail core competencies, recommend for the different uh, analyst proficiencies. Uh, and there's this new appendix nine, which I referred to earlier and I'll speak about a little bit more in a minute. Um, the example training courses that are relevant for analysts, that's been updated and expanded. And also there's uh, just clarity on refresher training and the fact that this needs to be on a, a training needs basis and obviously in line with the, the, the control of asbestos regulations, ACOP requirements, which, which have a lot of detail as you uh, appreciate on training. So I thought we'd look into a bit more um, about core competencies here. So Appendix 9 basically contains um, sort of a number of competency tables for different job roles. So people doing four stage clearances, people doing surveying, people in the lab doing bulk analysis. So there's loads of detail in that. Um, and I have had feedback that that's been really helpful um, and a really useful uh, addition to the to HSG 248. Um, and as I said earlier, they were really included to illustrate that simply attending a training course doesn't make someone a competent analyst. There's more to do. And, um, and yeah, the plea, my, my second plea of the day, uh, there's more. Um, HSC would ask training providers to stress this point and really signpost um, analysts and their employees, employers to the tables because um, you know, this is really what should form part of the continuing professional development of an analyst. Uh, so hopefully that will be helpful and, uh, and improve, improve competence overall. Okay, so now we're moving on to chapter four. This is about bulk sampling. So going out and sampling asbestos as part of a uh, maybe a survey or just generally a sample as a result of a, an incident perhaps. Um, tables 4.1 and 4.2, um, they basically present uh, all the sort of the strategies for sampling bulk uh, asbestos and how you would go about doing them. So a lot of that is probably taken from HSG 264, but I think it was felt useful to put it in here in these tables, um, just to have them in one place. But obviously anyone that is doing bulk sampling should also be looking to HSG 264 for, for technical guidance as well. And there's some new information about surface dust sampling, um, which, often causes uh, a bit of confusion or not confusion is probably the wrong word um, but really it's to do with the interpretation uh, you know if you just find one fiber what does that mean uh, and so it's as, as much as that um, rather than uh, the methods perhaps of how to do that uh, some new information regarding labeling and packaging of samples sent for analysis whether that's using uh, the royal mail or other couriers um, further information or it's this new standard I've put it in in uh, inverted commas it's not a standard as such but um, there's definitely more uh, as a bulleted list really now of what records uh, and, and what um, reporting should be um, in when you do sampling uh, what, what information needs to be recorded um, and this is really again to increase consistency of reporting um, to assist clients and traceability so that, that's a new uh, a new or improved uh, part of this chapter. And there's also um, new reference to sampling of stone materials, so stones and rocks um, that may contain small amounts of asbestos. So some of you may be aware of some guidance we, we released a couple of years back now uh, about asbestos in marble. It was found in the veins of marble. So that has now been included in, into this document to um, and, and that and um, to sort of reference that or acknowledge that 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 occurs as well. Okay, so chapter five. Um, this is about measurement of fibre concentrations. Um, 
this is make a measurement of asbestos in air basically um so personal sampling uh, well, if you're measuring asbestos in air, you're either doing it as a personal sample or you're doing it as a, a background or static sample is probably the right word. Um, and this is something where as an occupational hygienist, this is what this is the our bread and butter as a hygienist. We spend, uh, I certainly spent my early years of my career putting sampling pumps on people and measuring their exposure to, to asbestos, to lead, to solvents. So, um, this is something I'm quite passionate about, um, and I know Martin Gibson, who I should have credited at the start, actually, because he's the author of this of this guidance, uh, one of the, the, eight, the lead authors, but um, he was very passionate, and as, I'm, as am I, about trying to improve the standards of personal sampling, and particularly, um, as you'll see in a minute, um, making the results a bit more useful than, than just being a, a tick box exercise. So um, more contextual information to be collected by the analyst. Uh, there's a new template report form in Appendix 6 um, detailing the information to be collected. And we're hoping that that um, will help push people to, to record extra contextual information. Um, emphasis that personal sampling should be representative of the work activity. Unfortunately, there is this, um, this sort of culture I suppose or habit I don't know again probably not the right words of just uh, doing monitoring for an hour that that equals personal sampling for asbestos and um, that is not that's not always correct um, certainly it needs to be representative of the whole work uh, activity or the whole work day um, but depending on what you want the result to, to mean and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute um, table 5.2 um, again those of you that are involved in sampling, uh, will, will, uh, this will be of relevance to you. Um, but previously, there was this very much this, the, the World Health Organization has this um, method, which uh, our method is based on. Um, but the method put, uh, so basically puts some very sort of specific or strict guidelines in place. Um, and one of those was uh, it, uh, well, originally last, last the last revision. It was say, it was that one uh, sampling for personal sampling against the control limit um, had to be done at one liter per, uh, one liter per minute as a flow rate, so the amount of air that, that gets drawn in. But that's now been changed to one to two uh, liters per minute. So that's uh, that's a, a, one of the, the changes in in that table. And also, um, probably won't be able to see it there, but this uh, specific short duration activities, so it's probably a new term really, um, and already I've heard people refer to it um, as SSDA, as I oh, renamed it, I'm happy with that, as long as they're aware of it, that's good. Um, but this is very much for where you're trying to assess the exposure um, or the level, I guess, uh, associated with a, a specific activity. So whether that be removing uh, AIB tower, tiles uh, or fine cleaning following AIB removal. Um, but the idea, the name hopefully evokes it, but it's really very much looking at a task specific activity and the exposure from that. And then um, finally, there's uh, some new guidance about sampling when um, wet blasting cleaning methods are used. Um, and particularly because they're associated with um, overloading the filters with the dust that's created from the, the blasting process itself, but also uh, the fact that it's quite a damp atmosphere. So there's some guidance to help analysts or help and let's work out um, strategies to try and overcome those issues. So yeah, I said I'd go back into personal sampling and look a little bit uh, in more detail. Um, so firstly, yeah, samples, when you're sampling for asbestos fibers, uh, those of you not um, aware, it's all about being able to see the fibers down the microscope. So if you've got a collected a load of dust on the, uh, on the, on the, um, on the, the filter as well, that will obscure the fibers and you won't be able to read it. So certainly when you are sampling for asbestos, that is quite a, that, well, that's a very important issue that analysts need to be aware of. And, and I think that's possibly one of the reasons why this one hour um, sort of thing has come in because you know, it's seen as one hour be enough before it gets uh, unreadable. Um, so we're not, so obviously samples do need to be readable, but the way to get around that is do multiple sequential samples. Um, and particularly, yeah, if you've got different tasks that are going on, um, 
select those different tasks and then you'll get additional information about the different exposures uh, and really all this really is all about trying to demonstrate that the workers are removing asbestos using controlled methods and that those controlled methods are um, minimizing their exposure. As I said, results need to be meaningful. It's not just, oh, we've done personal monitoring, this is the result, tick. Um, you know, what does that mean? Um, maybe it's because I'm an occupational hygienist, but I get really passionate. I want to know why. Um, you know, why was that really high? You know, do you know why? Do, no one like watched um, watched what they were doing when they were re removing the asbestos. I used to have to sit down for a whole day watching workers, um, I don't know, burn lead rivets off uh, off a train uh, a train undercarriage. And I'd, been, I'd, I'd know which worker was doing working in a different way because I was observing them and I'd make a note. But this is very much what, what this is all about. The results need to mean something um, and you need to ex be able to explain why that worker had a particularly high exposure and perhaps was um, expected in their risk assessment. And that information also needs to be recorded by the analyst and then that will make it a much more user uh, user sort of document or user results um, because you can say well that was a, a spurious result because they inadvertently um, dropped a, a piece of AIB but then equally you could have a, a new worker who perhaps hasn't been trained enough or it might just be sloppy and they completely haven't um, used sprayed it down enough or, or carefully removed the, the AIB tile so all this actually you know, there's, there's, there's rich information that can be sought and be really useful to inform risk assessments. Um, and that's why oh, David Bellamy there. But yeah, that's why it's really important to, um, to record the contextual information. And then just to, to, to sort of also make the point that with asbestos, um, there's also, there's a number of regulatory, I've called them regulatory outcomes, but I guess what they are, reasons for doing personal monitoring. Um, so obviously there is a requirement to make sure that uh, uh, licensed removal contractors, their exposure is kept below the control limit um, as, as low as reasonably practicable. So, um, and I will always say that the control limit is not a limit to work up to, but a limit to work down from. Um, so that is the one thing which they need to demonstrate, uh, the employers need to demonstrate. Um, but also, as I was saying earlier, checking the adequacy of the control measures that are put in place for a particular job. Uh, and that will then, that information that you get will then feed back into the risk assessment. And obviously in plans of work, license removal contractors have to put an estimation of exposure. Um, so that would go in there. Um, and also it allows them to monitor their, the performance of their employees. And obviously personal monitoring is also a requirement for um, health exposure records as well. So I think it's trying to get this, this message over that it's really important that, you know, you, if you're paying for personal sampling, you're taking the time, um, the trouble to wear a sampler, make sure that you get what you need to get out of it. Okay, so we've moved from personal sampling to static sampling. Um, Really, this is just clarity um, on the use and limitations of uh, phase contrast microscopy. So that's a little bit more technical there. Um, guidance for sampling situations where there's no direct work with asbestos. So perhaps like a rear, um, maybe around a contaminated land site, possibly, um, you know, strategies, what you should do then. Um, clarity on background and reassurance sampling, including these, these two terms, which I think are new, near source and far source perimeter. This table here, um, table 5.1, I think this is really useful, um, particularly it sort of summarizes um, static sampling and the different types and when they would be mo most appropriate. So that's definitely um, one of my favorites. Um, and then table 5.2, um, which I alluded to earlier, that includes clarification on the use of higher sampling rates. So you're sampling more air, getting more volumes or sampling for longer durations, which might be more applicable when you're doing um, background sampling in low dust environments. So maybe perhaps around a contaminated land site uh, or reassurance sampling, um, maybe in a, a context where there's been a, a sort of uh, an incident or something. So um, hopefully that will be um, useful for static sampling. As always, I, I, I go on longer than I should. So I do apologize, but um, hopefully um, this will oh, I'll only be about another five minutes, I think. Um, so chapter six, which is uh, basically site clearance, the four stage clearance uh, and the certification. So 
there's this new handover document um, and this is, uh, I'll talk about it in a minute, but there's a template again given in Appendix 6. Um, there's a little screenshot of uh, what part of it looks like there. Um, so this, uh, and I'll, 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 I don't want to talk about it now because I'm going to talk about it in the next slide. Um, there's clarity on the function and application of the clearance indicator. Um, often we find it gets used or referred to uh, in, a, in, in incorrect situations and it, just really to reiterate that it's, it's very much to do with the maximum acceptable limit for airborne fibre levels following asbestos removal, that's what it is. Um, there's a new recommendation for the analysts to be involved in scoping and planning of the work. I mentioned that right at the start. So again, this, is, this sort of follows through into this chapter as well. So yeah, this handover form, um, this was actually sent out to the license removal contractors via the, 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 the asbestos network or the asbestos leadership council, I think, as it was called back then. Um, and I was actually chatting to, some of the um, some of the inspectors uh, that, that, that do the license assessment renewals, and they were saying they actually feel they actually find it actually has been up, has been quite a good uptake from license removal contractors of it. Um, so I think that was one of the fears that uh, analysts wouldn't be able to see this this handover form, and, and they would perhaps be put in a, an awkward position um, if if it wasn't present. But um, the, the sort of uh, it's been refreshing or really good to hear that that seems to be. Um, in use within the industry, uh, so that that's really good news. Um, but really, the handover form, what 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 is it for? Um, once they you've removed asbestos, um, uh, once they've removed asbestos, the site supervisor normally um, should carry out a visual inspection um, to to basically be able to hand over the site to the analyst to allow them to do their independent uh, four stage clearance. Um, and this, this visual inspection that the license removal contractor does, um, it must basically be uh, that it's completed to a satisfactory standard, which is no visible or dust or debris. That's what we want. Trouble is, uh, and as you, again, you will see from the, um, the license, the uh, um, analyst inspection project, which I alluded to at the start, um, enclosures being handed over unclean. Um, what does this do? Exposes analysts to asbestos fibres unnecessarily. You know they're not meant to go in there um, and do removal themselves, um, which they did find. This was this is what we found. Or actually, people it puts time pressure on analysts because they think oh, we've only got got an hour. They've made it. They haven't cleared this up. I'm going to clear it up for you, um, and they would rush their inspections. That is not the environment that is conducive to this level of important work. Um, and by 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 letting that happen, um, you know, it sustains this poor handover culture. You know, it's like um, people not cleaning things properly. Um, you know, we want really good standards of cleaning. Um, the license removal contractor, it's their duty to clean the area uh, where the asbestos has taken place. Um, the analyst provides that independent verification. The license contractor's got to complete the handover document. So, um, and there's a signed declaration and they hand that over to the analyst. The analyst then records that in the certificate of reoccupation. Um, and they shouldn't, the, the guidance, uh, the HG248 says that the analyst shouldn't start the independent clearance until that document's been received and satisfactory. But that said, if they don't receive it or they haven't done it, then they should make a note in the four stage clearance report. And obviously that will go to the client. Um, and then you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that needs to be rectified going forward. And as I said, um, license removal contracts are being specifically asked about the handover form um, at their license assessment renewals. So um, I'm hoping that um, this isn't going to be a, a, a problem and people are going to recognise the importance of this. So it's really, really formalising the, the handover process. And eventually this will go into HSG 247 uh, guidance as well for the license removal contractors. Um, so site clearance and certification, just a little bit more on this. And um, there's a new template. Um, again, that's in Appendix 6. Um, there's this new requirement for analyst employers to estimate the job timing. So one of the issues we found was that um, people, uh, analysts were going on site and not being, um, just going, turning up for an hour, allowing an hour or a couple of hours. Um, and without that information to do um, how long the job might might take. So 
this is really to do with planning that so that they can actually look at what the work involves and then make an estimate um, depending on the complexity of the removal process or simplicity even and then record how long um, the visual inspection should take um, and there's a table table a 5.4 which has got some scenarios um, based on different types of acm the location and the size of the area um, the complexity so you can see some of those i don't know if you can see but you know some of some of these clearances might take or visual inspections i should say eight hours um, you know I don't think people or clients or licensed removal contractors may necessarily realise that that can be the case for very large sites. Um, and it's really to try and get employers to build up, employers of analysts to build up the data, but also I suppose licensed removal contractors as well, because they're the ones that need to also account for this time. And also so that they can um, inform their clients and make sure that the contract does allow for sufficient time for that particular, for the, for the, for the four stage clearance to take place. Uh, and then again, greater clarity for the analysts not to carry out any uh, cleaning themselves. Um, there's more, this is new requirement to act for the analyst to provide photographic evidence uh, of site cleanliness. Um, and each part of the new form has uh, a requirement to put uh, a photograph in uh, to demonstrate that that work has been done or that, uh, that area is clear or cleaned. Um, table 6.1 specifies the photos to be taken. You can see that. And there is an option of providing video evidence, um, but that isn't as an exception to doing the form. Um, but that may be helpful in, in some in some cases. It's only an option. It's not an, an, an addition to the photographic evidence. Um, and there's some new, new guidance about cleaning areas after incidents or damage um, that will, and just to clarify that many situations will be non-licensed work and won't require for formal four-stage clearance. So just a quick, um, closer look at the four-stage clearance. Um, Again, a lot of this is to do about communication and cooperation. So the analyst and license removal contractor, you know, the, the message really is they really need to cooperate and support each other during the clearance process. Um, but it is the analyst responsibility to make sure that all the work that they do um, is carried out with diligence and impartiality. Okay, so whilst um, you, know, you can be all pally and stuff on site, but you still have, the analyst still has that, uh, that responsibility to be impartial and independent. Um, I always think, actually one of my colleagues used this term the other week, but a four stage clearance should be considered a forensic examination of an area following removal of asbestos. Um, so again, you know, it's a detailed, you're looking for dust and debris um, in a quite a large area and quite a dark area potentially. So you need to make sure you can do as much as you can to try and uh, find that uh, and make sure that it's clear, ready for the air test, because that's looking for things you can't see, fibers you can't see. So sufficient time should be allowed for that. Um, we've talked about this and also the photographic evidence and that the photographic evidence should also be captioned uh, and also be an appropriate photograph. Um, so you know, again, I, I don't know if anyone watches that uh, forensic examinations, uh, CSI I think is on BBC Two this week, but you know, they're, they're very much getting um, good photographs and they're highlighting what they mean. So don't just take a, a photograph that's uh, just sort of showing you know, nothing really. Um, it really needs to, to be a uh, good sort of evidential quality. Okay, chapter seven, we're nearly there. Chapter seven, soils and made ground. So this is a new topic in inclusion. Um, it's never been included before. Um, it covers basically the requirements where you would need to do a survey for asbestos and soil, um, but when there's a work activity. Okay, Appendix 7 contains greater information on sampling strategies and surveying how you sample soils. And also there's this Appendix 8, um, which is, relates again to soil and may ground, but this is to do with the on-site sampling and measurements of uh, both airborne fibres, but also dust, because that gives you, a, um, certainly when you're doing uh, contaminated land work, um, if, you, if you've got a very dusty site and you've got asbestos in it, then it's obviously it's important to very much control the dust by using dust suppression that's always needed when you're doing asbestos remediation of contaminated soils so um, there's some information about sampling strategies and and uh, particularly to do with uh, with contaminated land sites there so just quickly um, 
so just the, the important thing really here is to emphasize that um, this the, the information is really to do with making sure that those that are working on contaminated land sites, asbestos contaminated land sites, um, they uh, the, the, the information about the presence of, uh, of asbestos in soils um, is there to make sure that you can establish the right control measures that are required, whether it's dust suppression, PPE, uh, or even if the work needs to be done by a licensed contractor or is non-licensed work. Um, but the, the, the goal is to make sure that you reduce the risk from asbestos to as low as reasonably practical as required by the regulations. Um, again, I would emphasize this isn't a blanket requirement now. You must survey the, the, the site, if site for, for asbestos. It's only where you've got that existing knowledge. And often that existing knowledge will come from the geotechnical companies who are doing a land contamination survey um, in, in, in just generally uh, for other contaminants because asbestos might not be the only contaminant present on a lot of brownfield sites. And the other point I would make is that this guidance in HSG 248 is di designed to complement existing guidance. There's a whole raft of guidance out there for geotechnical people. Um, I used to do a bit of land contamination work uh, many years ago before I joined HSE. So I do have an insight into that, that, that field as well. So, um, uh, so yeah, there's, it, it's, it's not something new, um, but it, need, it needs to be sort of recognized that uh, this is very much for informing um, people's exposure, what those that work on, on contaminated land, and not for things like um, public health, if, they're, if you're building a uh, I don't know, some houses on asbestos contaminated land to make sure that they, they don't dig their, um, their raised beds into, into asbestos contaminated soils, okay. Um, so yeah, I think I've mentioned about the other, other, the other sort of legislation that will also require surveys, environmental risk assessment, waste legislation. Um, just quickly, I thought I'd um, indulge you in this, the soils and may ground, only because I did a presentation on this last week. Um, but yeah, and I'm eating up all the questioning time, sorry. Um, so asbestos products in soils, they're very, very difficult. Uh, I suppose the message here really, again, based on my experience as well, um, I think it's a whole different skill set that you need to look for asbestos in soils, in my opinion. Um, they uh, sometimes, you, sometimes if you're lucky, um, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, you'll be able to recognize that it's a piece of a, a, an asbestos product, but often it will be weathered or degraded. Um, you know, asbestos products weren't just pure asbestos. Uh, often they were like mixed in with things like um, calcium silicate and all this other stuff um, that would dissolve away. So you're just left, as that picture probably shows, a, a, the clump of asbestos fibers. Um, so I've got no idea what that is. Um, so Often it's important to, uh, you know, they're not that obvious and particularly if they're in what we call made ground, which is basically not natural soil uh, or rock. It's just a, a load of um, construction type infill, I suppose, is the other way of describing it. So it's quite difficult to identify the asbestos and pick it out. So there is a need definitely there, I think, for um, geotechnical um, specialists or geotechnical practitioners to have um, you know, the skills to be able to identify asbestos. I think this is really what this is about here. Um, so I won't uh, indulge you much more on that. Um, all nearly done. Uh, so personal protective equipment. So this is again for analysts. Um, it's more really sort of trying to make sure that they're more disciplined in what PPE they wear. Um, they shouldn't wear domestic clothing. Um, when they go into the uh, enclosures doing four stage clearance. I know when I was an analyst many, many, many years ago um, that we did, but that was the practice back then, but um, it, it very much shouldn't be now. Um, and there's a, I think this is really helpful, another my second favorite table, um, table 8.3, and that basically summarizes the minimum um, standard of PPE uh, and RPE to be worn. And also the, um, the the decontamination procedures, depending on what analyst the analyst is doing, so whether they're doing four stage clearance or just sampling, whether they need to do a preliminary decontamination or do a full decontamination where they go through the decontamination unit that's on site. And then talking about decontamination procedures, again, there's a much more emphasis that analysts do need to be prepared to go through a DCU. They don't know what they're going to find. Um, you know, they may have, uh, they may, 
encounter debris or contamination, uh, despite all the other sort of checks and balances that should be in place to make sure that the enclosure is clean, um, that there is still that, that eventuality. So they must be trained to be able to go through uh, a decontamination unit. And that's really what this uh, chapter is all about. Um, and there's a few other bits of clarification with us, which are there and some nice diagrams as well to help uh, communicate that message. Okay, so thank you. I'm really, oh God, I've gone over time. I did rehearse this and it was 30 minutes, but I think I've indulged you too much. Um, but anyway, if anyone does have it, I, I will, God, we'll have some time for some questions, but if anyone does, doesn't have time to type their question, um, but please you can uh, email me. Um, I'm very busy, but I will get back to you if you have got a question. So and if you don't want to, to be, do that now, or if you've got to go uh, and do something else. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been helpful. Um, I think we're we ready to go on to the questions. I did have one that was pre-submitted. Yep. Yeah, Sam, if you want to, um, yeah, go on. Right, to I've got a yeah. Question one already. You're, you're meant to come in there, Craig, so I could have a drink of water. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> right, brilliant. Um, okay, so someone submitted a question. Um, where persons are carrying out maintenance, um, so this is uh, sort of minor non-licensed work, so I, I'm taking this to be maybe, um, I would say, I don't know, drilling a, a hole in some AIB or removing a gasket. Um, they're asking what are the, um, besides the usual control measures, so using asbestos essentials, what pre and post work checks uh, would HSE recommend? Um, so. I think the analogy is probably being made here. You know, does it have to be uh, if we're putting it side by side with the license removal work and the four stage clearance, which we've just been hearing about? You know, what is the equivalent uh, that would be recommended? So the first thing I should say, there's no legis and unlike all those other things that are the four stage clearance, there's no um, legal requirement to have um, equivalent or um, air monitoring or, or clearance testing or uh, a clearance certificate issued unless it's large-scale textured coatings or um, the removal of asbestos cement roofs uh, which uh, those of you that I think it's HSG, HSG 33 which is roof work there's an appendix in that document that covers removal of asbestos cement roofs and there is recommendations there for um, for air monitoring, perimeter monitoring. So that, so put those to one side as exceptions. Um, I still think, I mean, there's there may be client requirements for this. There may be employer requirements. You know, if they want to have these extra checks, that would be good. Um, and yeah, it's up to you, that, 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 but it's not a legislative requirement. That said, I think these days, um, we've already talked about photographs, um, a pre-photograph of the, what the work area looked like before the work started, a photograph of, of it all set up as it should be according to asbestos essentials, so with the poly on the floor, the, uh, I don't know, the shaving foam or the gel um, near where the hole's going to be dr uh, drilled, the picture of the drill with the cowl head on it. I actually think that would be really, really good to sort of demonstrate that the, quit, the site was set up and the work was done with the required controls that are required by HSG uh, um, asbestos essentials. And then a photograph of the, the job afterwards showing that there's no debris or um, uh, um, mess around uh, afterwards. But, and I think, you know, builders and maintenance work, they do that all the time now. Um, you know, my builder, when he replaced the roof, he showed me before and after photographs, mainly because I wouldn't go up on the roof and, and look at it. But I think that is quite easy and, and sort of um, proportionate for this type of work. So hopefully that uh, that's helped answer that. Right, let me go in. Oh, there's lots of questions. I'm not gonna have time for all of these, am I? Um, yeah, there's about 20 questions so far. Okay, God, there's a really long one. Um, Okay, so any, um, I would say actually anyone that, um, any of them that are really technical, so I've already seen something about the um, drop testing instead of pinch samples, I'll have to refer that to my uh, colleague who works in the lab, um, so I will, I know people have put an anonymous attendee, um, maybe there's a way Craig we could sort of answer some of these uh, possibly, I don't know, to sort of, I just, I just need people to identify themselves if they they could do that or email me I gave you my email address I'll put that on yeah. again I put that on put that on again let me see well it's basically samantha.law.hc.uk 
www.gov.uk. Right, um, when is release date? That's an easy one. It's already released. Uh, I think I said you might have missed me at the start. Um, so it's online at the minute, but it's going to be updated at the end of this month and printed um, as an updated July 2021 version. Um, okay, I can't answer that. Um, yeah, can you use a phone to take photos in a live enclosure? And if so, how do you decontaminate? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think, well, I would suggest you probably get your own um, waterproof camera. That's certainly what we use when, when we go into en enclosures. Um, and then at least it's a dedicated piece of kit um, that you could, could use. Um, the only reason I would say that is because it's it's dedicated to be waterproof. Um, so it'll you'll when I say waterproof, probably not like drop it in, but um, a splash proof camera. Um, I, I, certainly, I think there's a there's probably a desire. Maybe if it's your own personal phone, um, or it might be a work phone to be honest. But I know a lot of them now don't have covers. Uh, well, they, they might, might be putting a waterproof cover actually that will cover up the charging ports. Um, so if you can get a cover that makes it essentially wipe proof, um, uh, that would be, and, and making sure, I guess, also that it doesn't have any sort of catch points where fibres could go in. So I, I suppose that would be the recommendation, either get a dedicated camera that's um, able to be sort of uh, cleaned easily or a cover for your phone um, that would allow you to decontaminate it without risk of destroying the phone. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, where am I? So I answered the, the last one first. That's not fair, is it? You go, it's right up to the top. Um, okay, will the July amended version amendments be listed clear to the reader? They are very much just a lot of the simple corrections. Um, so I don't think they, if there's anything that I, I must admit, actually, I, I'll go through them again, but I don't think there's anything that's going to be that changeable to warrant um, bringing it out, but I won't, I'll, I, I will, it is on my list of actually things to do to make sure that if there is something that's very important, um, that may, may be different, um, but I, a lot of them are just very small typos uh, or any sort of um, other smaller changes, but I'll, I'll uh, if there are anything, it will be probably presented out on the, not in the, the document itself, but on the landing page of the HS. HSE website which talks about the um, the document where you click to download it basically. Um, okay. Uh, point. Yeah, I can't do that. Um, so I've got two screens. That's why I'm looking away from you. Um, I don't understand. So yeah, someone's asked about, um, is there any further guidance for air sampling in relation to contaminated land and asbestos in soils? Um, so there is, I think I mentioned about that appendix uh, eight, which talks about sampling around the perimeter of a contaminated site. So that's where you're doing longer term sampling. And obviously the longer you sample, the lower the limit of uh, quantification limit of detection is. So there will, that, that, I think that will be captured within the document in there. You might have to look around. I think if you go into appendix eight, it should refer you to it. Um, but I should have said actually also with contaminated land, a lot of the a lot of the, the attention is to do with like um, providing reassurance monitoring to particularly if you've got residential areas or public areas around the outside. But um, I always say it's very equally as important to actually do the on-site sampling where the source is, because to be honest, by the time it gets uh, across to the perimeter of the site, all the asbestos fibers will be diluted. Um, and whilst of course there is a, a requirement to do reassurance monitoring, um, if you can demonstrate that those working in the, the asbestos area, if you like, 
if their if their exposure is controlled, um, then or, or at a certain level, then at least that that will also be evidence to demonstrate that they're working in, in ways to 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 such that you're not releasing a lot of asbestos. Um, so yeah, hopefully that that's answered that one. Um, Okay, so why have you not increased the volume of air to be collected in personal sampling? Um, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure what that actually means. I mean, they, that that guidance table five point two. That's the minimum recommended levels. Um, so it's not, uh, and it's really to make sure that account for the the for certainly for personal sampling for the control limit. It's accounted for the flow rates. So that has been increased. Um, so I'm not too sure, but remember, if you're using, if you're doing very task specific sampling, uh, like the short term, short duration activities, uh, that's two to four. Um, so that has, and, and all these volumes and times and graticules that you can, they can all be, you know, they can all be sort of um, adjusted to basically, they don't have to be what's in table 5.2, you can go go beyond that. I should say there's, there is some notes associated with that type table 5.2, so hopefully there'll be, that'll be explained in that as well. Uh, are UCAS going to give a greater emphasis to four-stage clearance planning and time allocated jobs? Um, I actually shouldn't have picked that one because I don't know the answer. I'd have to ask UCAS that, um, so I can't answer that one. Um, what are we doing for time? Oh, three o'clock. Do you want me to? Have we got time for one more? Yeah, we could do one more, Sam, and then the rest. Yeah, is sorry. Yeah, yeah. We'll, um, we'll get them answered and, and sent out. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm trying to do one that's quite. Okay. Is there. Actually, yeah, I should have said this. I often get asked. So someone's asked, is it intended to revise L143? Um, so L143 is the control of asbestos regulations approved code of practice um, there's as far as I'm aware there's no intention to review that some of you may be aware that it was a post implementation review um, which is a, a, a mandatory uh, requirement every five years to review all uh, health and safety legislation and other legislation I think um, to ensure that it's still fit for purpose essentially um, so that's just happened um, but uh, I, I don't know if there is any intention to review it but you know, that's that's sort of if anything that will inform any further need in the future to do that i also get asked whether hsg 247 which is the licensed contractors guide when that's going to be updated because clearly that was um i think i think it was published at the same time as hsg 248 um I do know that uh, sort of momentum is going to sort of start next year on that because this uh, HSC's asbestos unit has got that down as in their work plan to to do, and obviously that will have to go out to a wider consultation as well. Um, so so hopefully there'll be more uh, more of an update on that back then. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll, sorry, I haven't been able to answer all of them. I will. Yeah. Any. I'll, I'll, they, those the. the those of you that don't, well, I'll try, if those are ones that I can understand, <laughs> I don't mean to be disrespectful, I'll try and answer. Uh, if I don't, uh, I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll get back to Craig with those. So yeah, but thanks yeah. for asking all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So um, I'm just popping up um, a poll if um, everyone could just um, give us um, a bit of feedback. Um, only takes a couple of seconds to complete. Um, so yeah, just to close out, I just wanted to to thank Sam um, for for your time today. Um, there's been a lot of questions raised, um, which, as we've said, will um, will take away and, and we'll provide the answers um, by by email. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone's found the the webinar informative. I hope you've all got something out of it. Um, and yeah, thank you for attending today. Any additional queries, um, Sam's provided her email address, or you can email the Carter as well. Um, so info at ucarta.org.uk and um, just drop us an email and we can direct it to, to, to Sam or wherever it needs to go. Um, but yeah, on the whole, thanks for attending um, and um, yeah, you can leave the, the, the meeting as and when you've completed the poll. Thank you.